America's most talked about program is brought to you by Hazel Bishop Long Lasting Lipstick, America's favorite lipstick anytime. The lipstick you've just got to wear in the summertime. And now, here he is, Mr. This Is Your Life himself, Ralph Edwards. <laughs> I'll let you see us yet. This way, we've got a great one tonight. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to This Is Your Life. Everyone who loves our country and believes there's a chance for world peace will be challenged by tonight's story. What each of us can do to be a peacemaker on our own everyday level is illustrated powerfully by a man now walking toward this theater through the California sunshine. He's a big man from a big city, New York. So now, let's walk to the side door of this building. Our subject is being told that uh, he will see some films on public housing in the Los Angeles area. He was invited to speak out here uh, by the uh, founder of the new Los Angeles Settlement House, Henderson Community Center. So now, come on, since uh, he doesn't know Los Angeles, he does not know or suspect that our harmless-looking side door out here is actually the portal of This Is Your Life. Let me get out here a little farther. Would you open the door, please? Okay, gang, would you please just step right on inside? Hello, Mr. Williams. How do you do, sir? Why don't you come on in? Nice seeing you. As you see by these lights and the camera, uh, we want to record your visit, sir, to Los Angeles for the whole nation to see on television. So, uh, Mr. George Gregory, Jr., this is your life. <laughs> Gregory, Civil Service Commissioner of the City of New York. Come along now with me to our Chair of Honor. Uh, are you familiar with our show, This Is Your Life? Now stay right in here, good people. Yes, you? I am familiar with this show. You know This Is Your Life and all that. Well, our thanks to the noted architect, Mr. Paul Williams, for helping us surprise you. And this is... Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Miss Anderson, for your help, too, Francis Anderson. And uh, Mr. Williams, uh, we have to thank you for so many things, believe me, especially for tonight. Now, as we make our way to our chair of honor, Mr. Gregory, are you okay? Yes. All right. Then here's Bob Warren to remind us that summertime is here again. Thank you, Ralph. You know, this is the time when you ladies want to look your very best. And here's Joanne Jordan to tell you how you can. Remember, girls, no matter what else you do to keep yourself looking fresh and well-groomed, you'd better start with the right summertime lipstick. One that's not messy and, and uh, smeary. Won't run or feather no matter how hot the weather. And that means Hazel Bishop. For Hazel Bishop's new lipstick is so long-lasting, you can put it on in the morning and you're sure it stays on beautifully all day. Even after you eat something like corn on the cob. Or after you drink a long, cool soda or the hottest coffee. Your lip line is still perfect. Yes, girls, as you see, summertime is no time for a greasy, smeary lipstick. It's the time, most of all, when you need Hazel Bishop's new, longer-lasting lipstick. It's America's favorite lipstick anytime. It's the lipstick you've just got to wear in the summertime. You'll love it. Here he is, Mr. George Gregory, Jr., ladies and gentlemen. Paul Fine and Hanson Fellow. Come on, sit down here. Right over here. Man, six feet four. I'm glad he's on my side. As we'll see, thousands of people in New York have found in you a friend big enough to take up for them. This is your life, George Gregory, Jr., of New York City. <laughs> We all like to think of America as a nation of tree-shaded neighborhoods, small-town main streets, and nice backyards. For most American citizens, that picture is not true anymore. Today, the majority of us live in cities. Our community is our own city block, our local little shopping areas, our main street. And how we behave toward each other there is the real key to our future. Roughly halfway between Harlem and your birthplace on West 63rd Street in New York City, Mr. Gregory, lies Columbia University. At Columbia, George won our complete admiration as a great guy, a terrific leader, and the first Negro All-American basketball player in history. Now, it's been 20 years since you heard the voice of that pal and teammate. Can you tell us who it is? 
he's now a resident of Linwood, California. Your good friend, Mr. Remy Tiz. And Remy Tiz. <laughs> Did we really fool you on this, Mr. Yes, yes. tremendously. <laughs> Good. So wonderful. Now, besides being All-American, uh, George also made more history back in 1931 in his senior year, didn't he, Remy? Yes, because we liked George so much and because he was such a great guy, we elected him captain of the, of the basketball team. Yes. And for two years, he led us to the Ivy League championship. Wonderful. Yes, George was working his way through college with a job at the Harlem Children's Center, uh, wasn't he, Remy? That's right, Ralph. Uh, his, his eminence in athletics just led all the kids to follow him, and uh, he, he just found a, a great force uh, to, in, in welding their lives. Wonderful. Well, thank you for coming, Mr. Remy Tiz, yourself, an all-star intercollegiate athlete at Columbia. <laughs> Back downtown now to a small Negro district known as the Jungles on West 63rd Street. Your beloved mother brings you home, newborn, from Sloan Hospital across the hostile city blocks. In these years before the First World War, there's weekly violence and bloodshed whenever a Negro is caught alone across the line of Columbus Avenue. In that atmosphere which has twisted and embittered so many, you are saved. Yes, that was mother that, that was mother that became stayed home with us kids. Daddy didn't want mother to work. He said it was better to do without things so mother could stay home and tend to us. <laughs> uh, someone who shares your memories of home. Who is it, Mr. Gregory? My brother. Yes, your father and mother passed on, but he's here to represent your family, your brother and two sisters. From New York, your brother Rudolph Gregory. Come on out here, Rudolph. <laughs> you made it, boy. You got it. I couldn't make it. You, couldn't, you got through fine back there. The minute the kids in your neighborhood uh, went off uh, the, the block, there was a scrap. But George was always quiet and peaceful. Isn't that uh, right? Well, he was big enough to be pe peaceful. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there was, when there was trouble, uh, he sort of... Uh, he came around and quieted the kids down, made the kids fight fair. You bet. George attended public school 89, didn't he, Rudolph? Yes, that's right. Mother made us all go to school. And... Uh, he kept us kind of quiet, he kept George busy, and uh, made a nice made home, a nice for, home all for all of us. You bet. All right, Brother Rudolph, thank you very much. You're going to see Brother George a little later there. <laughs> okay. In the 1920s, while you're in your early teens, you grow restless and quit school. This is the dangerous time, the time of drifting, when the future of George Gregory Jr. can go one way or the other. The first time I saw George, he walked into the boys' department of the Harlem YMCA, picked up a pool stick, and ran 48 balls in the pockets without scratching. <laughs> Remember that voice, Mr. Gregory? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, former director of the boys' work of the Harlem YMCA. Here from New York is your great friend, Mr. William C. Anderson. Here he is. You bet. In his, time, <laughs> in his time of drifting, George had become a whiz of a pool player. Now, that uh, gave you an idea, didn't it, Mr. Anderson? I certainly did. Mm -hmm. As I stood there and watched those kids watch, uh, watching you yes. while you were running those balls, I realized at that time, making him a great leader because those kids respected you. Did Mr. Anderson get you interested in the YMCA, George? He did. He put me in a YMCA pool championship, citywide championship on that business. And also, we were happy about Andy because Andy was the warmest and the sincerest friend we had in that setup. That was an important turning point in your life, George Gregory, because it teaches you that boys must have activity to use up their boundless energy. Isn't that right? And if it isn't wholesome activity, they'll uh, go the other route. Is that right, Mr. Anderson? Quite correct. And you, a young torrent of energy, need only one more nudge to set the direction of your life. And what was that nudge, Mr. Anderson? Well, I got in touch with Coach uh, DeWitt Clinton High School. And he put something in George's hand, served as a magic ball, turned the tide of his life. That ball was a basketball. Mm -hmm. And that boy 
I found a genius at basketball. His mother and myself together talked to him and made him return to Dewitt Clinton High School. Now, another important voice, Mr. Gregory. Who? Palmer. You haven't seen him in, oh, 16 years, I guess. Now in retirement in Florida, your old coach interrupted a trip to North Carolina in order to be here. The famous coach of famous DeWitt Clinton High School teams and first basketball coach of CCNY, Dr. Leonard L. Palmer. Here he is. Good afternoon, George. I want to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Get up there close to him. Dr. Palmer says, sit down, George. I want to be able to see you here. <laughs> George's genius at basketball uh, caused another crisis in his life, didn't it, Dr. Palmer? Yes, he was so good, Ralph, that a professional basketball team offered him a large sum of money to join them and give up his high school days. Uh, George realized what that meant to the happiness uh, and better living that money would mean to his mother. Well, uh, what did your mother and Dr. Palmer do to get you to stick to your education, George Gregory? Well, my mother told me really that she, they didn't need the money and that it would be better and she would be happier if I were to continue with an education. And uh, I think Dr. Palmer was mainly responsible for this because without my knowing it, he had come and, and convinced my mother about an education. And I don't think I ever regretted it now. So another right decision leads on to all New York City championships for your DeWitt Clinton team in 1925 and 1926. And on to your All-American days at Columbia, a college education and a law degree from St. John's University, thanks to a loving mother and a faithful, far-sighted coach. Thank you, Dr. Leonard Palmer and William C. Anderson. Thank you. We'll see him a little later at the party, boys. So, George Gregory, Poverty and overcrowding in a huge city that you saw in your youth, temptations turned aside by right guidance stuck in your memory. In a moment, we'll see how they made you one of the greatest social workers New York City has ever known. But right now, I know you want to relax a minute, eh? Half time? <laughs> <laughs> and find out, we'll do this, and we'll find out what makes Joanne Jordan look so happy. Hi. What a wonderful time this is, isn't it? When we can all be gay, bright, and have that glad-to-be-alive feeling. That is, if we're dressed for the occasion. And take it from me, it's just as important for a woman to wear a summer lipstick as it is to wear her summer clothes. And that, of course, means Hazel Bishop. For Hazel Bishop is a longer-lasting lipstick that's not messy or smeary, won't run or feather no matter how hot the weather. And what's more, Hazel Bishop has the most fabulous new summer shades, including the three most beautiful pinks you've ever seen. Soft pink, pastel pink, and deep pink. The most gorgeous coral, and the only real orange. Yes, no matter which Hazel Bishop summer shade you choose, well, you can be sure that it'll stay radiant, fresh, and beautiful morning, noon, and night. Try it, and you'll agree. Hazel Bishop is the perfect summertime lipstick. And Hazel Bishop's new summer shades are out of this world. You'll just love them. Thank you very much there, Joanne Jordan and Bob Warren. Back now to This Is Your Life, George Gregory, Jr., brilliant social worker, now Civil Service Commissioner of New York City. the early 1930s, working your way through Columbia University, you're a red cap for a while at Penn Station. A classmate and friend, Charles Alston, gets you a new job at Utopia House. What, what was uh, Utopia House? What was it? That was the settlement house on 130th Street, and uh, he was the director of uh, activities at the house. And you go on to a similar job at the Harlem Children's Center. <laughs> One of those children singing for you, Mr. Gregory. Can you tell us her name? A career of a blind girl that flowered because of you. She's been sponsored in successful concerts by the great Marian Anderson. Here from New York is soprano Sadie Knight. Yeah. 
Yes, no, it's my dear. She's yes. watching, though, probably, yes. huh? Oh, yes. Yeah. How did Mr. Gregory encourage you when you were a young girl at Harlem Children's Center, Miss Knight? In spite of my blindness, Mr. Gregory always gave me the opportunity to sing on programs at the club. He encouraged all the boys and girls to develop their talent. Yes, and many of the boys and girls went on to high school and college to become civic leaders, social workers, and good citizens. Thanks to the influence of this fine man. To be sure. Thank you very much to you, Sadie Knight. Success to you. Continue Bye -bye. success. Bye -bye. After World War II, vast tides of migration begin within America. Harlem bulges at the seams and spills over into the Bronx. While New York's population is increasing 6%, the Negro population of the city increases 63%. The Puerto Ricans increased 200%. Now, what kind of a situation did this create in the Bronx, Mr. Gregory? A definitely difficult situation in which um, a community which was in flux uh, needed leadership and needed so many things in relation to overcrowded housing, uh, juvenile delinquency. We had very egregiously bad health statistics so far as infant and maternal mortality rates. And there was a general overcrowding of the schools so that children who should be getting six hours of exposure to education were getting only four and sometimes less than four hours. This is the Morrisini area in it the is. Bronx. Yes. About 10 blocks wide, 16 blocks long. Mm. In 1945, you were chosen as director of a settlement house named Forest Neighborhood House. And you walk into a hot spot. In a 10-block area during 1945 and 1946, seven boys were killed and scores shot and stabbed in juvenile gang warfare. Now that was one of the tough kids you converted in your years at Forest Neighborhood House. Mr. Gregory, do you recognize his voice? Sounds like Basil Hart. Here from New York is another of your living success stories, young construction engineer, Basil Hart. <laughs> Now today, Basil, you're married, working, and also going to New York University on a scholarship. Tell us how things changed with the boy gangs from the day Mr. Gregory here came to the Bronx. Well, Ralph, uh, Mr. Gregory didn't stay in Forest House. He came out into the street and found us in our hangouts. He didn't ball us out, he just talked with us. I see. Did Mr. Gregory try to break up the gangs, Basil? No, he didn't, Ralph. He brought the gangs right into Forest House. And converted them from juvenile gangs into athletic clubs and had them compete in athletics. Wonderful. Four years, Mr. Gregory. You are mainly responsible for cutting juvenile delinquency in your area by 60%. Thank you, Basil Hart. Thank you. But teenage delinquency is just one symptom of the underlying problem. Conditions in the border area of the Bronx and Harlem grow worse. The city administrations were doing all in their power, but there was no way to cope with the growth of population in this section. Now, suppose the city had cracked down on dilapidated housing, eight and ten families living in spaces where only two or three should. What would have happened, Mr. Gregory? What would happen? Well, if they had cracked down and insisted on people moving out of the basement and insisted on the overcrowded houses being torn down immediately, they would have created a crisis in which hundreds and thousands of people who had no other place to go would have been thrown out of a uh, uh, shelter roof over their head. So, of necessity, the cleanup job has to move slowly. That's why Mr. Gregory brought us the plan he called the small bike plan. He came knocking on our doors, asking if we could help him clean up our own street and our own building. He asked us to understand, uh, understand our new neighbors and give people of another race a break. And he, makes us as, and he makes us as Negroes understand that we have to learn to live with our neighbors too. Members of four representative families living in the vicinity of Forest Neighborhood House of the Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish faiths Italian, Negro, Puerto Rican. And here they are, Mrs. Joaquin Rosario, <laughs> Mrs. Ali Clark, Clark, Mrs. Emma De Rosa, Mrs. De Rosa, and Mrs. Jack Cunin. Come on, Mrs. Cunin. 
Now, a great part of the Bronx is a beautiful residential area, but like most metropolitan centers, it has its rundown area. Now, what is this small bite plan? Mr. Gregory got the people interested in Ms. Rosario. Well, he got us enthusiastic about New York or any city being cleaned up block by block. He also made us realize that the block is our, us, our community and our, our responsibility. See? Now, what happened in your block, Ms. Clark? Uh, Mr. Uh, Gregory got us to form a block association, and with his own hands, he helped to clean up the streets and remove the rubbish. We planted grass and, and shrubbery. We did a real clean-up job. Does it look good? It's beautiful. Uh, we, um, uh, he said, Mr. Gregory suggested that we uh, form a, a committee and raise funds for trees, have a tree fund. And we did just that. We, the, we planted 36 trees on Forest Avenue and vicinity. And uh, the, the children of the community became the forest rangers and helped us to protect those trees. Do you feel that this plan would work in the rundown areas of other cities, Mr. Gregory? I definitely do. I think that it's a plan that uh, makes room for the ideas of people who live in their own community. And it's a plan that could spring from them and could make a great deal of difference in many of the neighborhoods that need rehabilitation. Now, what else has Mr. Gregory done to make uh, life not only bearable, but happier and better in the border area of uh, the Bronx and Harlem, Mrs. DeRosa? Well, he's taught us that as true neighbors, we should uh, dispense with our fears and dislikes of one another. And uh, Forest Neighborhood House has become a center where we and our children can become friends with our neighbors and their children. You also work effectively with the New York Housing Authority. Huge low-rent housing projects like the new forest houses are built on the fringe of the segregated areas. Uh, Mrs. DeRosa, Mr. Gregory, uh, I believe, has been said, feels that if people of different kinds refuse to live as neighbors in such projects, uh, the hope for such areas uh, is doomed. Uh, does he feel that way? Yes. Uh, he feels that uh, we should get along together and uh, moving into a neighborhood is like pioneering. And uh, we like pioneering and we like our neighbors. Now, you too have children, Mrs. Uh, Cunin, and moved your family into the, the uh, new pilot project, Forest House. Uh, why did you move there? Well, because our houses are, are very good houses and they're near good school, and I'm very happy to live there. Thanks to Mrs. Uh, Gregory. Gregory. Do you think he has a good idea there? Oh, right? yeah, sure. He, he's the, the instigator of the whole thing. <laughs> well, apparently, uh, so does uh, Mr. James uh, J. Lyons, president of the Bronx. I have a telegram here from him. Uh, as president of the Bronx, he says in the telegram, uh, I salute a noble citizen who has made great contributions toward housing, health, harmony, and curbing of juvenile delinquency. George? I am disappointed that I cannot be with you tonight. May I offer you an old Irish toast? Quote, may your happiest days of the past be the saddest of the future. Unquote. God bless you. James J. Lyons, President of the Bronx. Well, I thank to all of you for coming, ladies. Thank you very much. You'll see Mr. Gregory a little later on there. Thank you, ladies. Well, this is your life, George Gregory, Jr of New York City. Your busy life, like that of most men, has been enriched by your lovely wife, who told us that it was better to tell of your work than to take time for a love story. But we know how important she is to you in your work. Herself, a supervisor of social work in the Department of Welfare in New York City, the girl you met at a basketball game, you've always said, your wife, Helen, and here she is. <laughs> and your daughter, Jeanette. Here's Gigi, your daughter. <laughs> oh, my, sit down here, Dad. We'll put the Gigi on the chair, on the arm. Great honors have come deservedly to you, George Gregory. The Schaefer Achievement Award for meritorious service to your fellow men. Appointment by Mayor Wagner of New York to many of the cities and the state's top boards and committees. You stand for the truth that if we look out only for ourselves, we're really lost. And to have peace in our own streets is the first step toward peace for our world. One thing we think is important on This Is Your Life is that in dealing with real people, there's never any pretense or sham. Now, Procter & Gamble doesn't believe in pretense or sham either. Take this 
amazing new shampoo, Prell, liquid Prell. Procter & Gamble weren't content to make it just good. They made it extra good, extra rich. That extra richness, Bob, must be the reason I always get that gorgeous, richer lather that does a better shampooing job. That's right, Pat, and because extra rich liquid Prell is extra rich, it gives you radiant beauty in every drop. And my hair feels so soft, too. I noticed the difference the very first time I used liquid Prell. Well, Pat, you noticed that difference because new liquid Prell is different. It's different from any other shampoo you've ever used. New liquid Prell is the exciting new companion to famous Prell in the handy, too. This is a great family favorite, too, and it's wonderful for the shower. So everybody try wonderful new extra-rich liquid Prell. It's the radiant shampoo that leaves your hair with that lovely, radiantly alive look. You're so right, Pat Garrison, Bob Warren. Well, now, looking ahead with you into your future, George Gregory, Hazel Bishop sees first a happy party in your honor tonight at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, where your family and friends all have accommodations. I mean, you'll be able to talk over with the whole game. How did a, a fella this size keep you in tow, anyhow, a coach? Oh, by the muscles. <laughs> I see. And uh, Hazel Bishop will present you with a movie, a film of tonight's program, you see, so you can play it again. The, the gang would like to see it probably up the center. And a 16 millimeter Bell and Howell sound projector and the 16 millimeter Bell and Howell uh, movie camera, you see. Oh. Now, this gift for your wife from Hazel Bishop from Marshall uh, Jewelers. Uh, it's a 14 karat gold charm bracelet made especially by Marshall Jewelers of New York City. And we have for you these gold cuff links and tie bar there. It has the date of your marriage there. Also, my goodness, you can't forget the Hazel Bishop <laughs> lipstick. There it goes. Knowing your wish for the future that Forest Neighborhood House may continue to be a magnet and a gathering place for all the various peoples of the Bronx, Hazel Bishop wants to contribute a gift of this magnificent Admiral Television phonograph combination with a big supply of records. Oh. Now, uh, we know also you never refuse any of the many calls made upon your leadership for uh, civic causes of all kinds in New York City, Mr. Gregory, to help you increase even more your life of service to your fellow citizens and to make your busy days a bit easier, Hazel Bishop presents you uh, with these keys to a brand new 1955 Mercury from Cole Finder, Chicago Mercury Theater. Well, this is your life. George Gregory, Jr. You'll have a lot of things to talk over tonight, won't you? Most of all, find out from your wife how we pulled this whole trick on you and help Paul Williams and everybody. That was quite a trick. Now, by being a peacemaker every day of your life, you have illuminated again the great American principle that all men are equal in their dignity, their destiny, and in the sight of their creator. Only under that principle will we find peace on earth. Good night. God bless you. Our guests fly into Hollywood by TWA, Transworld Airlines, who now fly the newest and most luxurious airplane in the skies. Fly the finest. Fly TWA Super G Constellation. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you again next week when This Is Your Life brings you another personality, idol of young and old delight. Who is it? Next week. Till then, good night, everybody. Good night. This is Your Life is a Ralph Edwards production produced and directed by Axel Gronberg. This is Your Life, America's most talked about program has been brought to you by Hazel Bishop Long Lasting Lipstick, America's favorite lipstick anytime. The lipstick you've just got to wear in the summertime. Tune in again next week when This is Your Life will be brought to you by new Liquid Press.